Hi everyone, welcome to the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. Today I'm flying solo, I'm doing it without Steve. Steve's really busy this week, he has a huge backlog of work from his patrons, he's plowing through that stuff. Uh, however, also today's episode is a really special one and I kind of wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one talk. So today I'm going to be talking to Oleg Kutkov and he is Ukrainian. He lives in Kiev and he is a guy who's working a lot on the Starlink satellite dishes that you may have heard of back at the beginning of the Ukrainian war where uh, Elon Musk and Starlink sent some truckloads of these uh, the Starlink dishes to the Ukraine. They turned on service for the Ukraine so that people in that country could get uh, coverage. And I know that these devices are being used a lot by the Ukrainian military on the front line. And Oleg is a systems engineer. He's a hardware guy. He's a software guy. He works on networking gear, on signals processing. And he was already interested in Starlink. He'd already bought himself a Starlink satellite even before the war, even before that, because, you know, he, he's a nerd like you and I and, and wanted to learn more. And then when the war came and then these uh, satellite dishes, he was one of the people in the Ukraine who knew a lot about this stuff. And uh, when Elon Musk and uh, when Starlink, sorry, turned on the coverage for the Ukraine, he was able to use his dish that he had previously acquired and get the connection. And this got him a lot of t attention internationally. Uh, it was one of the first people to be able to get this service inside of the Ukraine. So I want to talk to Oleg because I think it's a fascinating story. Now, I live in Estonia. I'm in Europe. It's a small country just north of the Ukraine. Uh, I'm probably about a thousand kilometers from Kiev right now. We have a border with Russia. Estonia was formerly part of the Soviet Union. So there's a lot of emotion there. There's a lot of feeling. Uh, we're a NATO country, but still, you never know. And uh, I, it means a lot. We have a lot of Ukrainian refugees in Estonia right now. We've provided a lot of support uh, to the Ukraine um, definitely per capita because Estonia has such a small population that it's easy to get those stats up per capita. Uh, so it was really, this is a personal episode, I guess, for me to talk to someone who's doing something real, something happening uh, in the Ukraine. So I really wanted to talk to Oleg. He's got some so interesting stories. Uh, later in the podcast, you're going to see that he has a Starlink satellite dish with two bullet holes in it. And he's in his uh, evening work after he's finished his day job he's helping some of his uh, fellow people to repair their dishes and the military guys that have had them shut up on the front lines and he's actually shows us the where the bullet holes, holes are in a dish and shows us the sh piece of shrapnel that he's pulled out of the dish and to me I just think that's an amazing story and I think it's such a interesting story about that when you have something like the war um, it takes all types. We need the soldiers, glory to the heroes on the front lines, but those guys and girls need logistics. They need support. The home front is just as important as the, the main front line. And Oleg is a guy who has a really specific set of skills. He's very knowledgeable in his area, and he's been able to use that to make a real difference and help in his thing in his area and to his country. So I want to talk to Oleg. Uh, I want to hear about what he's doing. And I really like this talk. He keeps such a good sense of humor. You can see the sense of optimism that is in him and, and must be in a lot of Ukrainian people as well. Uh, he can still have a laugh, even though, you know, they're in the middle of, of something terrible that I think I, I certainly can't comprehend even where I am exactly how it must be for him. So that's why I wanted to do it myself. I know I didn't usually do these introductions before then, but I wanted to set up why we're talking to Oleg and why I think he's an interesting dude and why his his work, I think, is really vital. So we're going to get into it now. This is Oleg Kutkov from Kiev in Ukraine. Let's go. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Oleg Kutkov. He is in Kiev. He is Ukrainian, and I'm talking to him today. Uh, Oleg, first of all, how are you doing today? How how are things in downtown Kiev today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's uh, okay in Kiev right now because uh, all the forces, uh, all the enemy forces move to east and south of Ukraine. Mm. So yeah, in Kiev it's relatively calm. 
uh, despite some uh, air raid alarms and rocket strikes once in a month, <laughs> I guess. But yeah. <laughs> You, 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 once in a month, hey, it sounds like you set your clock to it, you know, so regular, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was way better than it was in uh, March or April, because uh, in April, every day I woke up and read the news about uh, what was blown up, uh, what building, what, uh, I don't know. Hmm. So, yeah, it's way better right now. Okay. So what's it like, um, how to say, I mean, you're, you're doing fine. You're in your apartment. When you go down the street, when you go to the center, what's the feeling like? What's the scene like? Is it regular, not regular? What's the mood of people, let's say, downtown in the center? Uh, yeah, I can say that uh, almost everything looks uh, okay, uh, but uh, a lot of militaries around. Mm. So it's uh, the only thing that changed. A lot of militaries everywhere, but yeah, people are welcome, smiling, uh, visiting movies, <laughs> restaurants, and so on. Yeah, sometimes uh, we can even forget uh, that uh, it is war. Mm. But, yeah, I think it's uh, great because it helps to stay sane, to mm. stay calm, because we don't need any additional panic or uh, something. Definitely, sure. Like regular things, that's what's needed. Just go to the movies, yeah. Go have some dinner, go do something. If you can forget for a little while, and it's not a bad thing. Because, I mean, there's no way you're forgetting. So if we can just uh, think about something else for a while, that that's cool. So, uh, right. So by military, you mean there's a lot of, like, army guys hanging around on the street providing security and, and stuff like that. I don't know what they're doing, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they just walking everywhere. We can meet them on, on shops, on the streets, uh, everywhere. Okay. I think they just rotating. Maybe it's part of the regular army that fighting, and then just rotated to, to just to relax okay. here. Yeah. So, how was it for you? I know a lot of people uh, were, were were leaving Ukraine, um, and that's also why I'm interested to talk to you here in Estonia. We've got a lot of Ukrainian refugees, and I know the things we've been doing to try to integrate and and and, and help your your fellow countrymen out. Um, for you, was there a thought that maybe you should go somewhere else? So, what was part of your thinking? I know there was like a law that you can't go, but yeah, you know, it's not just about law, right? There's there's also some spirit or some feeling or reason to it as well. So. What's it like your story since the war started to, do you want to go? Are you trapped there or what's up with that? Yeah, I'm living with my wife and uh, we thought a lot about uh, leaving the Kiev. But then we decided that it might be better and safer to stay here at home because it's a capital, a capital it is well protected. Uh, I, heard, <laughs> I heard about this. Uh, so, yeah, at this time, a lot of pe people moved from Kiev to the west of Ukraine. Mm. Uh, it was a little bit panic. All the roads were overloaded with cars. Uh, so, yeah, mm. it, it, was, it was chaos. So, yeah, we decided that we don't need this chaos to be part of this chaos. So, yeah. We had electricity, water, internet connection. We have plenty of food, so food. So why why move somewhere? Because uh, actually we don't have uh, where to go. Uh, yeah, we, why why we need to find some new apartment and uh, what what we should leave, what, what we should take with us, uh, how I continue my work. So yeah, there were a lot of questions. So we decided to stay in Kiev. Mm. Yeah, just be careful. That's interesting, man. Uh, I think that that question of whether to go or whether to stay is... Like, I've, I've got to admit, I thought about it as well um, uh, here in Estonia. And, okay, Estonia is a different situation because not NATO. So if, they, if the Russians come over here, then this has some different implications. And when I... When I uh, I know that we have a lot of NATO hardware here, a lot of tanks, planes, oh my God, soldiers. So I know that's different, but um, still when I thought to myself, like, cause I was like, okay, well I'm Australian, right? So I could fuck off back to Australia whenever I want. 
but I, I had to sort of sit down and think to myself and think like I don't know and that thing that we were talking about earlier that even me being here in Estonia I'm not sure I can completely comprehend the situation that you're going through and I think I've sort of left it to a decision that for me I'm like I could only make that in the moment because I can't comprehend really what that would be like whether to go or whether uh, like yourself you have found a way to use your special skills and abilities to help and in such a wartime we don't you know we need soldiers but we need many other people doing a lot of other specialty things as well so all right so like i mean so right now day to day okay first let's back up a little bit so what was your job before this happened uh, yeah, I am embedded system engineer in telecom company, one of the biggest. So we are producing different kind of networking hardware like switches, routers, uh, Wi-Fi access points and so on. So yeah, I worked as a firmware engineer and I continue my work and nothing changing. Uh, yeah, and also initially I thought well, if I leave the key, how I continue my work because I need all my equipment, all my computers and so on. So yeah. yeah. It's uh, not easy to move <laughs> my my lab, yeah. So yeah, I decided to stay and continue my work because uh, I can work fully remotely because I need everything I, that I need at home. So yeah. So your company makes networking devices, did I understand? Yeah. Okay. Is it a brand that we've heard of, or is that do you talk about that side of your stuff? Yeah, you, you you probably heard it's uh, Ubiquiti Networks. Okay, Ubiquiti Networks. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're working on those systems. That was what you do. Um, huh. uh, right, so that's what... Uh, were you working in an office before this or were you still already working remote from home? I work in an office just before COVID. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, our office is still in Kiev. Yeah, I can visit it sometimes, but I just move everything from the office to home. So, yeah. All right, it's, and how is yeah. the the company going is the company still operating somewhat regularly or has it changed its output to help or what's going on with your company mm, actually nothing changed it's operating okay so yeah hmm. because uh, we had a lot of offices around the world so yeah we still in touch we get in the latest hardware we can send our work because our work is just code hmm. so yeah we can upload code to github and other repos and yeah it's okay we can deliver. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good because I, I was thinking to myself, like, um, like how do uh, you, you've got to help out? You've got to do your part for for the effort and everything. But I was like, oh, how do you earn money? I mean, you still got to buy food. It's still a regular life. Uh, you still want to go to the movies, like you said, or, or go to a restaurant or something. So okay, it's still regular day job. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, our, our banking system is working. Me, it's okay, basically. So yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it's um I know here in Estonia we've talked a lot about because we've got we've had the uh, digital ID system for a long time. We've all got ID cards and Estonia has been very worried about the invasion well ever since whenever. So I know they've got uh, Estonia even has the idea of a digital embassy and they have servers I think in Luxembourg or something like that that can act uh, as a backup. So if something physically happens here, uh, they can switch the government servers. So uh, I don't know, whatever they need to, to run the government effectively, uh, they can essentially switch over to those ones in Luxembourg and then continue to provide those services to the population, even if we, we can't physically get access to our, our place here. Do you guys have like ID? Can you digitally sign in Ukraine? Do you have that? Uh, yeah, services. yeah. We, we also have a lot of uh, digital services. So we basically we have a mobile application uh, that contains all the information like passport, uh, medical data, uh, driver license, and so on. Yeah, I, I, and I heard that all the data data is hosted somewhere on Amazon Web Services. Uh, so yeah, I think it's all protected. And mm -hmm. yeah, we we can do everything with this mobile application. Also, we have a lot of other different services. Uh, basically, just in Telegram, a lot of uh, government Telegram channels. So we're getting all the notification, all the news uh, from Telegram channels. 
Oh, wow. So was that before the war as well? Or this is something that emerged as a need? Uh, after some some, some ch channels were exist before the war. Uh, for example, we had a special channel, special telegram boards, uh, just to pay uh, for gas, for electricity bills. And so, yeah, I can run this bot. I can send uh, data from my counters at the bank money, and then I, I can pay. So, yeah, we, we had uh, all of this just before the war. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, all of this were expanded. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, yeah, we have a special channel that notifies us about air, right alarms, uh, what's, mm -hmm. going, what's going on, <laughs> what's blown up, should we hide or should we not. So, yeah, <laughs> that's why Internet is so important in, in Ukraine and mm -hmm. it's important to be connected. Right, and and we're going to get to that as well with yeah. the Starlinks and, and how they've contributed. Uh, yeah, the work I, um, back when I was working uh, in computer science, I was saying that I, I work in, in integration and some of my, uh, like 15 years ago, I was doing early work on Estonia's uh, messaging backbone, the backbone that connects the different systems, um, population register are to um, all the different government systems. So, yeah, I kind of had some insight early into to how these things work on the back end and uh, to get it all connected. So, okay. So, first of all, thank you for having good humor. Jesus, uh, it's great that yeah, you're, you're able yeah, to smile. Yeah, yeah it helps a lot, yeah. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. So, um I think, uh, oh yeah, so let, let's, anyway, I want to trace back a little bit with you. So you're, you, you're working for, as a systems engineer, you're writing this stuff. Uh, has, look, have you always been a massive nerd? <laughs> we love nerds. Like, has that always been your, your thing or what, what's your education? Um, or but here's a good question. What's your first memory of like a, a computer or a console or what's your first taste of this? Oh, it was uh, back in 19s, uh, yeah, early 19s, uh, when I first uh, time saw a computer. It was one of those 8-bit uh, Soviet-made computers, maybe you saw some in, Sto in Estonia. It's like a Spectrum clone mm -hmm. or something like this. So yeah, my friend had one of these machines, so yeah. We most of the time we played on this machine. Uh, there were games that loaded from tapes. Uh, yeah, it was fun. It was amazing. But then we tried to cut something. We get uh, some old book uh, with a bunch of code on basic, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we spend the whole night uh, trying uh, <laughs> entering the text, and then at the end we got error message so we, <laughs> yeah. basically we spent three hours just for nothing but yeah it was fun that's cool yeah and maybe people listening uh maybe younger people don't know that's how it used to work i remember this i had a amiga 500 and a magazine might have some code printed in it that you've got to type it in yourself to make a, a program work uh did you do any more coding on that spectrum uh knockoff uh, Soviet Spectrum, or what was what was the first thing you you decoding on then? Uh, I had a big gap between nineteens and uh, early two thousand. Uh, yeah, because I just don't have a computer. Yeah. I have I have a game console. It was uh, one of the Nintendo clones. Uh, yeah, plus. Uh, I had a Sega clone, <laughs> also, uh, and a bunch of games. So, yeah. Do you call uh, all of those Dendy? Is that just yeah, the Yeah, yeah, of... Dendy. Okay. Yeah, it was a trademark created just for ex-USSR market. So, yeah, it was some Chinese company that produced all this. Uh, there are a lot of different models, but all the basic is the same. So, sure, they yeah. the, the yellow cartridges. Yeah, yeah, yellow... It was like uh, 100 games in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all games were, of course, uh, pirated. <laughs> pirated. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, but it was fun. It was a good uh, base. Uh, so, yeah. I built my first uh, IBM PC computer in 2005. 
So yeah, I just go about all the parts and build my first computer. And then I start, started trying basically everything. I started coding, I started uh, 3D graphics, I started video editing, even music editing, uh, so everything. <laughs> yeah, I tried mm -hmm. everything. Then I end up uh, with uh, Linux operating system and uh, coding. So yeah, this is, was maybe official start of my computer <laughs> career. But yeah, regarding not uh, maybe I always was a nerd. I always <laughs> was a fan of um, science fiction. I read all the books, uh, watch all the movies uh, like Star Wars, uh, Star Trek, uh, and so on. <laughs> what was available on TV or somewhere else. Oh my God, I have so many uh, questions about this. But for, um, okay, just a, a different one though. Uh, would you still today build your own computer from parts or would you just now these days it's just buy a computer for you? Uh, I'm building from parts. Uh, yes. All my desktop computers, I have two desktop computers in my apartment. Uh, yeah, all my computers were built from parts. Mm -hmm. So in 2005, when you built your first computer, was it was this stuff easy by then? Was it easy to get this stuff in Ukraine and was it... Uh, were those bits still, would you say they were expensive, relatively speaking still, or was it by that stage easier and more sort of regular, you could afford stuff like that? Yeah, it was easy because we already had a lot of uh, computer markets, uh, uh, computer shops, so yeah, we, we can go and buy everything <laughs> that was on the market at that time, any CPU, any motherboard, uh, any hard disk and so on. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, did you uh, did you study this at all? Did you did you in you know, a technical college or university or have you have you done something like this? Uh, I have a master degree in computer science, uh, but yeah, everything that I know I studied by myself. Okay. Just reading books, uh, some magazines. Uh, you know, I started from very old uh, Soviet era magazines about electronics, about computers. Uh, because I had a lot of in my local library. So, yeah, I just read everything that I had, had in a library. So, yeah, because I didn't have internet. Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's also so interesting. So we're coding from books, we're coding from yeah. magazines, and we're getting some of these from the library. Oh, God, this is great. I mean, again, I remember it did exactly the same thing. I remember my local library, you could, uh, they were even renting, you could renting, loaning like CDs and I'd go and copy. I, I could get a CD and uh, it was, my computer was not fast enough to directly encode it to MP3. So I had to, and I didn't have enough hard drive space. So track by track, I had to rip to WAV file and then convert to MP3. Rip, and that each track is about an hour or, or something like that. Also, it was an interesting era, uh, but uh, after when I built my computer, I still don't have my internet connection. Hmm. So, yeah, I had to go to a special place, <laughs> internet cafe, <laughs> yeah. just to download some sites, download some software documentation and so on, and burn it to the CD or floppy disk <laughs> and bring, bring everything home. <laughs> So for you, when you were getting your, your education in, in Ukraine, um, because you've got a computer science degree, and I have a computer science degree as well, but it seems now that most of your work has gone into embedded systems, leaning more towards the hardware side. So was this interest always there, this hardware hacking side? or And also, like, was there not, did you not have, like, a, I guess, the electrical engineering version or the... You know what I mean? Like, is it? Did you just have computer science as a subject, and that was like everything, or what were the yeah, courses available? Yeah, it, it, it's just uh, it's just computer science. It's like algorithms, uh, databases, uh, mm. operating system, and so on. Yeah, hardware is just my own interest. Yeah, I always interested in hardware. I s uh, started to study electronics. Uh, I don't know also in. Uh, early 19s so yeah <laughs> i read a lot of books uh, i started collecting some uh, old pcbs uh, some components and i tried to build something like uh, radio receiver amplifier 
some I don't know device that just blinks <laughs> blinking device. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. That's cool. Oh. For me, I was never that good at, at hardware. I think I was always more on the software side, and we had some straight up electrical engineering courses, and I was always a bit dumb at them. I could never quite get the <laughs> hardware for me i don't know software always came out uh a bit more simple i was actually um a few months ago three months ago i, I got a chance to go to australia back home and i had not been home for about five years um because of course covid and then even some years before that and i took my girlfriend she's never been to australia before and we went to my university to just walk around the corridors you know just to, to show her and um they had piles of, they were throwing them out, piles of the old textbooks just sitting in the corridor. And there was uh, Korba. And, uh, oh, my God, I was like, Jesus, why did we learn stuff like this and the old relational database books? And, uh, yeah, that was kind of cool to, to do that. Um, did you do, I mean, masters. You, there's bachelors and then masters. So how come you chose that extra year or, or whatever? You decided you didn't want to leave university yet? Yeah, I decided to get a better <laughs> degree just in case uh, for future to get a better job and uh, something. Yeah. Okay. I have the I got the master's degree as well, and it was for me it was one extra year. Yeah. And I yeah. just I wasn't ready to leave university yet. I think I was still having too much fun going out and having a good time. Yeah. Cool. So working. So let's jump forward to to a bit more today. So you uh, you had already before the war, before we kind of thought about this, you had already got yourself a Starlink dish. Yeah. Okay. Previously. So what was your plans for that? What was your thinking around getting one of these? Uh, yeah, I started following this project project from the beginning uh, two years ago because uh, it's just a cool project. It's uh, something new. It's a phased array antenna for homes. Uh, so yeah, I am a big fan of SpaceX and all the space stuff. So yeah, sp space plus electronics, it's always <laughs> the best combination for me. So yeah, I started uh, collecting all the information. I tried to figure out how it works, uh, even without any hardware so yeah i uh, read all the pat patents uh, all the available articles and uh, so on hmm. <coughs> then i decided to get one of the dishes <laughs> yeah i found it on ebay and it was delivered in train uh, in december december last year so yeah i never thought that i ever use it in Ukraine because, uh, yeah, to work with Starlink, you need a coverage, you need a service in this mm -hmm. location. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and I know that there were not any plans for Ukraine, for coverage in Ukraine uh, back in December. So, yeah. I decided just to disassemble this device to see what's inside. Uh, to dump uh, firmware, to see how it works, and so on. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I spent a few months uh, for this work. I learned a lot. I got a lot of information, a lot of interesting information. Uh, and then <laughs> war, war started. Uh, so, yeah, it was uh, last day of February, and I saw Elon Musk tweet that uh, starting service is already active in Ukraine. So, yeah, I decided to try it with my terminal. I had to put it back together to, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, to, to build it, to rebuild it again, uh, to make sure that it can boot. <laughs> it's working. Yeah, it's working. So, yeah, I had to speak with uh, SpaceX support because uh, this terminal was originally for US market. So, yeah. It's not working in it's not working in Ukraine, but yeah, it takes one extra day. But yeah, then it just started to work, and it was amazing because I already get a great quality of service. Uh, the speed was great; it was almost two hundred megabytes per second. So yeah, 
it's even you know I don't have a great position uh, for the starting terminal because because it requires a clear sky, uh, especially on north because uh, Starlink needs to see all the satellites around. Mm. Yeah, and everything that I have is my apartment and a balcony. So yeah, I just uh, placed my dish outside my window. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, just hanging, hanging outside my window. So yeah, but anyway, it's connected and it's working. So yeah, I wrote uh, a post uh, in Twitter. I uh, recorded a speed test uh, on my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, it this uh, video. I don't know. Maybe it's. Uh, uh, Forty-eight thousand uh, likes <laughs> collected. Yeah, e even Elon Musk liked it, my video. <laughs> yeah, Not it was an yeah, it was an achievement. Mm. Um, yeah, and that's when I first came across uh, your tweet that came to my attention as well, and I, I started to follow you. So, what was the? You, you said that you had an American Starlink dish. Uh, what are the? Is it just a software difference that they had to configure yeah. on their end? What was the? Di just that is it? Yeah, it's just software. There is no hardware difference between uh, terminals. It's just a software, software lock, because uh, there is a unique ID uh, inside terminal, and yeah, they just uh, have some database, I guess, uh, where they match as IDs and uh, location of the terminal. So yeah, they just allowed uh, my ID to work in Ukraine. All right. Um, is there because I, I, I've never used a Starlink myself, so I don't know. So uh, when we say that the, the coverage was turned on in Ukraine, uh, do you need a subscription or something for that? Or is there some payment? Or how does that part of it work? Uh, yeah, there is a monthly subscription, subscription. So basically, you need to input your credit card details in your account. So yeah, it's just simple. So yeah, it's cost uh, currently uh, 110 US dollars each month. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, there is a free three months in Ukraine for terminals that deliver directly to Ukraine. This is a special offer from SpaceX. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, they did a lot for Ukraine. Uh, they helped a lot. So yeah, we really appreciate SpaceX support. Sure. So um, before we get to, to the SpaceX thing, so that first day's happened. Um, so how, uh, and I remember that tweet of yours and you kind of have got the dish kind of out the window yeah. doing your best and you were, you, were, you were tweeting that you were surprised that even just a and it was getting a reasonable speed. So how would you describe Starlink? Is it, are they generally easy to aim and to focus the signal? I'm sorry, I don't know the technical term there. Are they difficult like that or how do they go? Uh, not at all. You know, in a normal situation, you don't need to do that because uh, uh, from the factory, starting to equip it with a mount, it's a special tripod uh, stand with two motors. So basically, you put it somewhere outside, mm -hmm. connect uh, to the power supply and just turn on and it's uh, aligned themselves. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it's all automatic. You don't need <laughs> to do all the stuff that I did. Okay, but you had removed that stand and that motor, so yeah. you had to do it yourself. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's impossible to reattach uh, currently. So yeah, I just decided to skip <laughs> yeah. all of this. So yeah, is the is the dish itself? Is it uh, this unit with the motor in that? Is it? Um... Where is it usually meant, like to sit on a, a roof, a balcony, on the grass outside? Where are they usually leaving these in a typical circumstance? It uh, depends on the situation. Uh, typically, it's a roof. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because you need a clear sky. Uh, if you have some, I don't know, big garden <laughs> without uh, tall buildings, so, yeah, you can leave it just uh, on the ground. Okay. All right, that that's cool. That's interesting. Um, so, uh, the thing that most of us heard about. So it was the big news. Papa Elon comes along, and he 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 says he's going to help. So, do you know how many uh, Starlink dishes were delivered in that kind of load? Was it just one? And was it one delivery or multiple? Or tell us about the amounts that have been sent. 
Yeah, it was there were multiple de deliveries, and uh, today it's more than ten thousand active terminals in Shit. Ukraine. So yeah. many. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, and I heard that uh, amount of active terminals on the east of Ukraine, it's uh, maybe more than in US in total. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because uh, Starlink is so popular among militaries, they use it, it everywhere. Uh, yeah, I can, I can tell some details. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of active terminals on the front line. Mm. Uh, I've heard a fair bit about the the way that the I know the the Ukrainian army were asking for a certain brand of drone because I think it was the DJI that apparently Russia could uh, like a target or but locate somehow um is there as far as you know does the the opposition have some ability to target starlink dishes and locate them uh, no it's not possible uh, um, so uh, starlink uh, it's a two device dish itself uh, plus uh, wi-fi router mm -hmm. so yeah uh, you can't uh, track the dish because uh, frequency is so high well, there is a uh, beam steering, so it's transmitted basically in direction of satellite without any additional signal. So yeah, it's technically hard to detect this terminal, but Wi-Fi router is uh, another story. So yeah, uh, so the general recommendation is uh, not to use Wi-Fi <laughs> on front line. Sure, or don't don't call your Wi-Fi Starlink satellite. Thank yeah. you, Elon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, when? Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, because also uh, you were doing some work with, with the router. The router only has Wi-Fi, not Ethernet. Did I understand that? And you were doing uh, work to add the port back to it. Uh, there are two models. Uh, okay. First model that uh, came up with original Raon Dishi. It's a big uh, terminal. Uh, this router. Has Ethernet port. It's a <laughs> yeah. It's a regular, just a regular router with two Ethernet ports. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to build uh, something custom. I don't know why. Uh, they skipped uh, Ethernet port and they decided to use some custom uh, connector. It's so uh, it's like it's a USB Type C, but not really USB Type C. It has a different shape. Uh, so yeah, uh, to use uh, to get Ethernet port on this router, you need to buy a special uh, accessory, a special adapter. So yeah, uh, and I decided to do some uh, reverse engineering <laughs> just to to find uh, what's inside of this adapter and is it possible to bring uh, Ethernet port back? And yeah, it's possible. It's I don't know why SpaceX <laughs> did that. Uh, if they try to be more cost effective or something, but um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. It's uh, it's only a few bucks uh, of components, uh, so yeah, maybe they had some reasons <laughs> for this. So the 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 dishes that were being delivered, or let's say the ones that are being used used in the east near the front line. So are they the Wi-Fi only models? Uh, it's 50 50, okay. I can say. Uh, yeah. And in case of Wi Fi only model, it's you can't uh, remove the router. On older version, uh, you have uh, DC itself, uh, router plus uh, PoE power supply. So mm -hmm. you can just uh, ditch your router and connect any other equipment uh, like uh, your laptop directly to the DC. Mm -hmm. And yeah, without any Wi Fi. Uh, with new terminal, they decided to put uh, power supply inside the router, so you don't have any option, and uh, there is no uh, Wi-Fi kill switch, so you just can disable Wi-Fi. Okay. So yeah, and you <laughs> you can't remove the router because you, then you can power your DC. Right. But yeah, there are only uh, there are some solutions that were developed during the war. The custom uh, PoE injectors that uh, may power the DC without uh, a router, without SpaceX router. Mm -hmm. Right, because I was about to ask, has that been a problem for users on the front line that they have to use this Wi-Fi version? 
Yeah, and I know that uh, Miltaris lost lost a lot of uh, dishes on the front line. Mm. So yeah, I got one of the uh, terminals that was <laughs> hit by the bullet. It's so, one yeah. one of the maybe hundreds of terminals that were destroyed on the front line. Mm. But you think that I mean I'm not trying to be controversial, but you think that this choice, this Wi-Fi only choice, has meant that they're more easy to target or more easy to be seen or less convenient i mean i know elon wasn't thinking about the war when he was designing it fair enough yeah it's, it's convenient for home but it's inconvenient uh. for the war war so yeah it's easy to target wi-fi signal so if you have a wi-fi on a front line then you should expect uh shooting anytime yeah okay huh so to come back to when they first arrived, so you're an engineer, you know about this stuff, and then Papa Elon says, I'm sending a load of of these things. Uh, how, how does it go? Like, tell us about those days. I mean, do you reach out to them and go, hey, I know about this stuff, I can help you? Is it because it's Ukraine, everyone knows everyone already? Did you already have connections to this? How did you sort of help out or get connected to this project? Okay, uh, after my tweet, uh, I uh, woke up with a lot of uh, messages <laughs> in, uh, yeah, yeah, on Facebook, on Twitter, everywhere. So yeah, people, a lot of people asking me about how they can connect to Starring, how they can get the hardware. They ask a lot of questions. Uh, so yeah, and I found that a lot of people don't know what is starting and uh, how it works <laughs> so what is starting they just know that it's some way to connect to the internet without wires uh, without the wi-fi and uh, so on uh, it was a uh, maybe dangerous days uh, of ukraine in the beginning of the war so yeah a lot of uh, infrastructure were destroyed uh, and targeted so yeah, a lot of people lost uh, their connection, uh, especially in areas near near the front line. And they lost the uh, internet connection. So yeah, but as I said, it's very important to <coughs> stay online. So yeah, all of these people <coughs> just, I don't know how they found me. They read it somewhere, they heard it somewhere. So yeah, they started asking me the, all this question. So, I answered to all the questions maybe three or four days. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was the same question. So uh, I decided to create a Facebook community uh, where I can share all the information that I can share, that's safe to share, all the <coughs> tips, uh, all the help. So, yeah. And uh, now it's uh, more, it's almost 2,000 people in this community. Mm. so yeah it's uh, it's it's an active community so yeah we have a lot of posts we have uh, a lot of uh, useful information in this community mm. and uh, i know that it helped a lot of for different people for militaries for civilians and so on how would the dishes originally i mean when they they come how who's coordinating this how do they decide who gets one how is who's in charge of who gets a dish uh, there is a special ministry in ukraine uh, yeah they try to coordinate all of this for militaries okay. uh, but uh, civilian just can order the dish directly from spacex it's possible but it may take a month to deliver okay. yes yeah, there is uh, a trick uh, if you have some address in Poland, for example, yeah. uh, you can order for Poland address and it takes one week, typically one week. So, yeah, then uh, you can uh, just ship uh, your terminal from Poland to Ukraine to any destination. It's uh, two more days. Uh, and yeah, you, you, you have your dish. Okay. So, right. So, oh, right. So that, that's interesting. So some people or most of them, I guess, are buying them privately themselves and the government ministry was in charge of handing out those ones that were, they were donated by SpaceX, a number of them. Did I understand that or not? Uh, uh, yes and no. <laughs> they okay. were donated, but uh, 
I can tell that some payment uh, just postponed for the future. So okay. yeah, it's not totally free. I don't know what will happen with all this DeFi after the war. Mm -hmm. I expect a lot of them on eBay <laughs> because people just want to pay uh, 100 bucks a month for the internet. Yeah. Sure, I can imagine after the war, when you get your regular infrastructure back, like you said right now, you're on a, a fiber optic connection right now, you're on your regular thing. Uh, when that, that infrastructure is restored after the war, then maybe we don't need so many of them in the Ukraine anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most active users of Starlink is militaries because mm -hmm. uh, they use it, it for drones control, uh, for syncing, for some streams. I heard that they using Stalin to sync Hovitzer's attack. Oh shit! How it's yeah. okay? So they're using it with the aiming somehow. They they're using these. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are some intelligence that finds a target, and then they use Stalin connection, which is uh, really fast and mobile, uh, to target all the Hovitzer's in different location to some target. Yeah. Tremendous! Wow. So, okay, so the and because they can just the the army guys can basically set it up in the field, the motors and yeah, it's, you know. it takes uh, five minutes uh, to get connection without, mm -hmm. and you don't need any special knowledge, you just uh, need to know how to put it outside and uh, plug it in in a socket. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so with the I, I don't know, do you know exactly? I mean, when we say the we're using it to target the howitzers are, are using this. Is it the how it, I don't know if you know, does the howitzer itself have some need for an internet connection to help it aim? Or is it the operator can look at a map or something? How do, do you know how that helps? Uh, there is a special software that uh, developed by Ukrainian, Ukrainian military. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I saw it once. So it's basically a map with all the targets and this program calculates all the angles and so on that uh, should be entered uh, to the harvester itself. Mm. All right, that makes sense. And really, yeah, very useful then. Okay, that's yeah. on the go. So uh, where you are, let's say in Kiev right now, do you have 3G, 4G service? Is that available in Kiev? Yeah. Okay, yep, normal. So how far, but over in the east, this isn't available anymore or is how how are those services as far as you know over there uh, i think it's work almost everywhere even mm -hmm. on a front line huh. yeah because there is a funny thing that uh, it's <laughs> i don't know it's very special war because everyone is using internet even uh, our enemies and we basically <laughs> watching the the same YouTube uh, channels, uh, reading the same Telegram channels, and uh, so on. And also, they used our, our infrastructure just to call home. Mm. And yeah, that's why we have a lot of uh, intercepted uh, talks between <laughs> Russian militaries and they, their families. Uh, so yeah, because they just using regular cell phones uh, and our. <laughs> our towers <laughs> to coordinate and to go home so yeah it's a very special <laughs> it's very I mean, very interesting there's so many things about this war that uh yeah yeah uh, the way that it's changed and the mo modern war i don't know if that's a good term to use or something like that like this is how it will be we're connected now it's no longer like right i i write a message to my my husband and he's on the front lines and he gets it five months later like some world war Two sort yeah. of idea that we have this is not at all it anymore huh yeah now we have uh, all the information just uh, in matter of minutes so yeah it's uh, everything blown up somewhere we know it's in one minute we have a video we have uh, all the information mm. okay is it um so starlink is important but so uh how to say should the military not be using 4G? Like, do they try to not use that infrastructure or they're just like, fuck it, we'll use whatever connection we have around us? Uh, there are a lot of restrictions for militaries, of course. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, they're not allowed to use uh, any 4G, 3G connection, pub public Wi-Fi and so on. 
Yeah. Uh, I know that they had some uh, special protected channels. Plus, they had one more additional channel. It was uh, Viasa two way system. Uh, you heard about this? It's also a satellite uh, based uh, solution, but uh, the system was hacked by Russian in the few, few, uh, first day of war. So, yeah, it's useless now. But Starlink is well protected. It's almost impossible to hack the Starlink. So, yeah, maybe mm. that's why uh, militaries choose this solution. Hmm. I don't know if this is a dumb, this might be a dumb question that makes you laugh, but have you heard of any instances where the Russian forces are using Starlight, Starlink as well, or never happens? I never heard about this. Yeah, sure. I, I can guess it's possible because they can capture some terminal, but uh, yeah, it will work on Ukrainian territory. Uh, so well, why not? <laughs> Sure, it could happen. So let so let's get to now the work that you've been doing day to day on this. So as I've understood, you've become some sort of de facto tech support, not only with advice in this uh, Facebook yeah. group, <laughs> but also the physical repair of, of these devices. So I guess let's talk about like day to day. What are you doing day to day with this stuff right now? Uh, yeah. Uh... Actually, uh, most of the day I spent for my regular job, for my, <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then uh, in the evening, in, in the night, I working on my own projects. I have a lot of projects uh, besides Stalin, so yeah, and also, yeah, I help in different people with uh, terminals. I uh, try to repay, repay something, uh, but... Uh, I can't provide a lot of help here because uh, I just uh, can't fit all the Starlink in my small apartment. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> all these dishes, uh, uh, they, they're huge with all these motors, uh, cables and so on. Yeah, I need a separate, um, I don't know, separate room for this. Uh, I can't afford it. So yeah. On this okay. week, I fixed mm. two terminals, uh, plus uh, I had uh, this terminal that was hit by a ballot <laughs> that I posted on Twitter. Yeah, uh, let's have a look at this. This is this is nuts. So, Yeah, here is a starring, and here's a <laughs> hole from the ballot. Here's the glory hole, wow. Yeah, and this is what I extracted from the PCB. It was stuck inside PCB. Okay, so, bulletproof dish. Okay, it's got stuck. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the dish was uh, damaged. Actually, there are two, two damaged areas on the PCB. Okay, here's dang. one. Yeah, and here's another. Okay. So, yeah, I had to cut, uh, cut uh, some of the PCB because this... Uh, this damage uh, creates a short circuit inside the PCB, so the dish just won't start. Mm -hmm. uh, I fixed it, and now it starts, but uh, it uh, stuck in a boot because uh, some of the lines uh, are damaged, and uh, the software just can't reach uh, some of the chips on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it looks like there is no any fallback. Uh, mechanism just to i don't know just to skip this uh, damage system yeah it just uh, stuck in a cycle trying to read the data from non-existent clients so sure. yeah I, okay yeah. they weren't thinking about bullet holes when they designed it Fair uh, enough, yeah maybe. yeah and uh, and i can't do anything with, with this because <laughs> the software is so well protected it's encrypted there are a lot of verification so yeah i just can't uh, get into it and replace with a custom firmware and so on it just uh, won't work okay so i uh, as i said i'm not very good at hardware so um those uh, chips that are on there are they receiving the signal like uh, how to say when you've you've got a hole and you've got some cut traces and yeah. it seems like you haven't repaired every trace. There's a big chunk there. So what are all these chips that are sitting over the dish? Is that 
are they individual receiving chips somehow? Yeah, or, right. yeah, yeah. It's a phased array antenna. Uh, so yeah, you can see a bunch of uh, I don't know is it the little black dots we can see there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's a bigger chips like this one, like this one, and a lot of smaller chips. Okay. Uh, all these uh, bigger chips is a digital beam former. It's a special IC that uh, forms uh, direction of the signal. Right. So yeah, uh, they using a lot of uh, a lot of chips uh, just to create a radio beam that they can steer electronically. So yeah, they they it's like uh, mechanical but without mechanics. So sure. yeah, just electronically. Uh, so to control all the things, all the chips uh, has uh, some firmware. So yeah, and uh, the CPU needs to communicate, needs to talk uh, to all these chips. And when the, ch the CPU can get uh, data from the chip, so yeah, it's, it's stuck in a boot. Right. So, uh, to, uh, um, how to say your theory is that. If the firmware, the firmware is looking for every chip and going, are you there? Yeah. Are you there? Are you there? So if the firmware didn't actively, like if it said you're there, oh, you're not there. Oh, okay. No problems. The dish might actually be able to work again if the firmware could be like, okay, no signal from chip. Okay. I'll move on to the next one. Uh, actually, I don't know, but yeah, okay. it, will, it will be interesting to verify <laughs> But uh, without, uh, all these chips, uh, you can get, I don't know, a less sensitivity of the signal. Mm. And uh, yeah, you need uh, so many chips uh, just to be able to precisely steer your beam to the, and to collect uh, as much signal as you can. So without uh, some of the chips, uh, you just can't get all the signal and you can't uh, steer your beam so precisely. So, yeah, I don't know. It will be <laughs> it will be great to verify. Right. Have you talked at all to to Starlink support beyond the first thing where you had to get the region thing? Have they talked to you? Is there anything like that? I sent uh, the link to my tweet uh, on my tweet to some SpaceX guys, and they say that uh, it was shared shared inside SpaceX uh, chats. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's their their reaction. <laughs> uh, yeah, obviously they can't share any schematics, any details about. You know, mm -hmm. all these chips are custom. You can't find any information about all the chips. Mm -hmm. Almost all the chips on the board. So yeah, it's custom design just for SpaceX. Uh, so yeah, and they don't want to share any schematics, any source code. Uh, so yeah, I think they just can't help me there to fix the system. Yeah. Sure. At some stage, it's gonna be broken. A few bullets go through it. Maybe yeah. it's done. Yeah. So, but likely there are more than 10,000 terminals in Ukraine, so yeah, they just always have a replacement. Sure, to get that. So these two, did they come from, uh, these dishes that you're repairing this week, did they come from private people or from some military? Uh, from military. Okay. Okay, so you have some connection there. and Yeah, it's not it's you. not direct connection with the military, it's just some people in the middle, but yeah, <laughs> I have... Have this connection, yeah. Okay, that you're the guy that. Okay, we, we've got we've got one that. Hey, I know a guy. I know a guy who might be able to help, and then somehow you get connected. And yeah, yeah, I'm just like an unofficial SpaceX <laughs> <laughs> ambassador <laughs> in Ukraine. So yeah, sometimes people asking me you know, ridiculous questions like, mm. "I made a payment, but my service is not working. Why?" <laughs> <laughs> so and. and where is my terminal? And my, I ordered it uh, one month ago, but it's not delivered <laughs> yet. <laughs> Can you help me <laughs> to solve this problem? <laughs> okay. Well, it's good at least that you're talking to people and you could say something to them, I, I guess. you know. Yeah, but, yeah. No, you're not UPS. No, you're not FedEx. Okay. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, all the, uh, how I say, good delivery services are temporarily not working. It's like DHL, UPS, and so on. So we have a regular post. Uh, 
Mm. So yeah, <laughs> it's trying to do it best, but uh, yeah, it's just a post. Okay. This because you, you you were saying that it's easier to get it delivered to Poland. So is this another thing where it's like you probably have a friend in Poland or something, and you know it's just yeah. easier if you know someone to to work from there. Yeah, and uh, I get all the information just from my community. So yeah, there are some people in this community who helps other people to get terminals via Poland and other mm-hmm. European countries. Okay, it's so interesting, so fascinating that uh, mm. these little intersections of that yeah. you know, your work and it suddenly it's become very relevant and it's something that you can do to help. And it's a question I've asked myself as well, like what what the fuck can I do to help? You know, I'm not military trained. Uh, I went to the gun range once or twice, but I don't, I don't know how to shoot a gun. Uh, and I, I asked myself, what can I do to help? And I guess that's fallen into your lap that there's this thing that, that you can do to help. I think it's really nice. Yeah. It's uh, everyone is trying to do something, uh, what they can do. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, not everyone is military, not everyone can shoot. Uh, so, yeah. Sure. We need logistics. We need people supporting those troops. We need... Yeah. Again. It's not just that. Huh. Okay. So you're... Uh, so you, are you right now, you're, you're paying the 100 bucks a month or whatever it is to get your personal dish going? Are you doing that? Uh, well, not. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's currently free. Oh, okay. Right. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Um, because I would imagine if, uh, if um, how to say, if your home fiber is working, then you personally maybe don't need to use it every day. Yeah, I'm just uh, using it for to continue my experiments. Uh, I don't know, just to see how it works, to get some data, like uh, speed test and so on, to share with community. Sure. Nice man. Actually, last night uh, I made, uh, I get uh, very interesting results with a speed test. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Starlink it's a system where you have uh, user terminals, dishes, satellites, and ground stations mm-hmm. where all the traffic is landed. Uh, typically, Ukrainian terminals are landed in Germany or in Poland. The two mm-hmm. SpaceX stations. But last night uh, my Traffic was landed in Seattle, hmm. USA. Uh, so yeah, it's very interesting, and I guess this means that SpaceX activated uh, those uh, uh, inter-satellite laser channel. And they yeah they thought about this. It's like when the satellite can uh, communicate with all the satellites uh, using lasers, laser beams. So yeah, I guess it is, but because uh, I I don't know <laughs> how how my traffic uh, can be ended in Seattle. Sure. So typically, before now, your assumption was that your beam goes up to a satellite, and then that satellite is sending it back down to a Starlink base station. In probably Germany. close yeah, yeah germany yeah. poland something close to you yeah but now yeah. your theory is is that the satellites have enabled something different that the satellites are communicating directly to each other yeah spacex told that they should uh enable the system by the end of this year but uh, i think it may be i don't know i i will try to repeat the experiment again but mm. maybe to just run some tests but yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> Seattle. It's even yeah. not it's even not east coast of the USA, west coast. So yeah, it's uh, more than uh, eight eight thousand kilometers from Kiev. So yeah. Mm. Okay. So why would we then? What's the use of that functionality that the satellites is it some sort of load balancing or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because. Uh, Currently, all the stations in Germany and in Poland are overloaded because 10,000 terminal just in Ukraine plus Poland users, Germany users. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot for uh, for single or two stations. So mm-hmm. yeah. 
Okay. So, all right. So you're you're experimenting on this, and how were the the lag time? You said it was 200 milliseconds or something. You yeah, yeah. How does that compare? How does that compare to a regular lag time? A regular lag time is uh, 50, 40. Okay. Yeah. I, I oh, guess yeah. I, got, I got to ask the dumb question. Have you ever tried to play an online game with a Starlink satellite? Uh, no, because uh, I'm not playing games on PC these days. <laughs> yeah, because if I want to play a game, I have a game console or game console. Yeah, but uh, I'm not playing games on my PCs. But uh, I know that there are some tests, so you can find it on YouTube. Some bloggers already played sure. games. <laughs> yeah, that little league. What do you play, by the way? What game consoles have you got at home right now? It's uh, Nintendo Clone and Sega. Okay. I I love old uh, games like uh, Battle Tanks, uh, Super Mario, and so on. <laughs> Actually, Mario is my favorite game. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh yeah, I got my I got my Mario T-shirt on today. <laughs> nice. It's going around. Nice, nice, nice. All right, so uh, we're getting a, a little bit over an hour here. Um, looking forward to the future to sort of wrap it up um is there a thought of i don't know how much do you think about the future right now um or is it just do we focus on day to day uh do you feel an optimism do you feel things well i don't want to say getting better that's but some improvement maybe an overall situation how do you when you let's just say when you think about the coming months how do you feel about it just with your life and as a person yeah, I'm trying to stay optimistic. I think a lot of things will change uh, this month uh, because of latest delivery of military equipment. Mm. So yeah, but it's hard to predict because uh, <laughs> Russians are so unpredictable. So yeah, they can make another act of goodwill and leave the occupied territory or they can uh, go to attack I don't, I don't know but yeah they, they whole strategy sometimes it's hilarious because they just uh, killing uh, all the personnel destroying thousands of uh, ammunition uh, tanks uh, planes <laughs> I don't know why they're doing this but yeah it is interesting it's um how to say I, I was speaking about before how do I feel in Estonia about this and um not only is okay we're the nato country and we have a lot of nato armor here planes tanks they were already doing this for a long time already um there is that thought in my mind of like could russia even do that like do they even have this capability left inside of themselves i don't want to be complacent though either uh i don't underestimate the enemy in this case uh, and it's hard to know sometimes because I just read reports like, yeah, Russia seems in some ways like the the guys on the ground seem kind of fucked, but they just keep lobbing missiles at you. Uh, I don't know. It's hard yeah. to know what to believe. Yeah, they're, they're spending all the new missiles on targets like shopping mall centers and so on. Mm. Actually, I think uh, now they have only some Soviet era rockets, uh, which is not uh, have great precision. So yeah, they <laughs> and packing everything that they have uh, in warehouses like old uh, Soviet tanks, uh, old hovices. Uh, yeah, because they just uh, lost uh, all the new equipment mm -hmm. in a few first months. So yeah. Yeah, I don't. That's what makes. I don't know what to think about that information. I see every day some report. Someone shows. Look, I see a tank, and this is something that fucking Stalin wrote in. You know, back in the day or something, and that gives me some hope. But then again, you think to yourself, don't underestimate. Don't underestimate. You know, try not to. Yeah. Yeah, because they, it's equipment is old, but they have a lot of this equipment. I don't know. They have some. Mm. Unlimited warehouses of this uh, old Soviet equipment. So it looks like they decided 
just to <laughs> clear all the warehouse and <laughs> sure. to put it somewhere. Uh, Actually, sure. we, we have uh, we have a little installation here in uh, city center. Uh, we have uh, three blown tanks, uh, some some radar system. Yeah, <laughs> it was blown up in a few months and just now sitting in a city center, just exposing for everyone. Okay, as like yeah. a morale, you know, Ukrainian people could feel better as maybe some you could class it as some weird art installation or something as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The creativity of the Ukrainian people. This is okay. What you're capable of? Whew. Yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, funny signs uh, on this uh, equipment mm. from militaries, <laughs> from like I don't know, go to hell to more creative. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So look, we'll wrap it up soon, mate. Um, what do you? Okay. So coming back to today, what do you do tonight? Is it just hacking in in your room there? uh what what what's the next what does today and tomorrow bring for you yeah today i would like to repeat my experiment with mm -hmm. seattle but it uh, depends on weather because it's raining all the day and uh, yeah i just can't put my dish outside <laughs> when it's raining because it's uh, even without any case uh, so yeah uh, if it's uh, rainy i have a lot of work to do from the software point of view, plus I have some additional projects. I will share it in Twitter <laughs> when sure. it will be finished. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Well, um, Oleg. Yeah. I mean, I guess to we could wrap it up here. Uh, anything else you kind of want to say, or is there some message you want to leave us with, or, or anything else as we close it out today? I don't know. I think that we all just need to stay optimistic. Everything will be all right. <laughs> yeah, it's good, man. It's a good thought to have. All right, stay on the line. As I said, we'll talk about the uploads, but I'll, I'll hit it here. Oleg, uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you taking the time out here. Um, it, it was good to talk to you, man. Like, uh, I, I don't know. It, it's hard, hard to say. Anyway, we, I could say here in Estonia, we appreciate the work that you and and all of your Ukrainian uh, brothers and sisters are doing for us. So, thank you very much. Thank you for all the support. We really appreciate it here in Ukraine. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for joining. I, I appreciate you listening. It's a very special episode for me to, to, to talk to Oleg today. So I'll see you on the next podcast. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.